Hello, my loves. Welcome to another episode of the Becoming You podcast. Today, we're going to be talking all about how to protect your energy. Now, I didn't even know what energy meant aside from the physics, the subject physics, right? Where we talk about how energy is never created or destroyed and energy just changes forms, right? Like sound energy becomes light energy or vice versa. That was always my definition of energy until I started getting into my spiritual journey and my spiritual awakening. And in the spiritual world, we talk about energy a lot. And specifically, we talk about your energy and the management of your energy. So if you think about it, we are not just physical beings. We're actually energetic beings in physical form. Okay, I want that to sink in for a second. We are energetic beings in physical form, and that's what a human being is. What do I mean by that? So our thoughts, our energy, um, the movements that we create with our bodies, we expend energy and we burn energy, right? When we eat, that was us consuming energy. When we run and we do our daily activities, when we're breathing, sleeping, we are We are taking the fuel, the water, the air, the nutrition that we take in and we transmute that and we burn energy through breathing, sleeping, our daily activities, right? So everything in this world is made up of energy. Everything, when you break it down to the the foundational forms of what we are, including things, it's made of energy. Now, physical objects, they are the densest form of energy. It's packed energy, tight energy, right? And thoughts and feelings is also energy, but it's a different type of energy to what physical human beings are and physical matter is, right? So they, in the spiritual world, I'm not an expert in this particular subject, but all the objects, so your reality, the things that we can touch, feel, sense, is the very last form of the physical manifestation of your energy, right? All the tangible things that are showing up in your reality today is the densest form of energy because that energy has gone from vibrating, right, as thoughts into physical matter. So I I shared this piece of important information because what happens is we try to change our external reality in order to feel different on the inside. That's what 99.9% of people do. We think I am unhappy with what's going on in my life, right? I'm stressed out. I'm overweight. um, I have a family, but I don't feel like super grateful for it. And then we attribute reasons that we think this problem exists, right? I'm, I'm, I'm stressed at my job, so I need to change my career, right? That might be the case. Like, I'm unhealthy. Um, it's because, like, you know, I'm, I, I don't feel healthy. I don't feel sexy. I don't feel attracted to my partner. Like, our intimacy, you know, isn't quite what it used to be. So we think, I just need to lose weight, right? That will fix all my problems, right? And so here's the thing. Yes, in the physical world, we do need to take action. But it doesn't start there. It doesn't start there. Most of us start with the thing that's external to us to fix whatever challenge is going on in our life. But we forget that that transmutation of energy starts within us, right? The reality showed up because of certain energetic things going on in our energetic being, which is our thoughts and our emotions and our feelings, which then led to taking the action. So if we want our physical reality to change, it starts with us changing our energy and our energy, meaning our mindset, right? Because your mindset, the way you think, like affects the kind of thoughts you have and the kind of thoughts you have lead to the feelings you have, right? When we think a nice feeling thought, we feel really good. And when we think a negative thought or a bad feeling thought, it makes us feel really bad, right? So it makes sense that our thoughts leads to our feelings and our emotions. And then our emotions drive us towards our actions. So for instance, if you say, oh, I really don't want to work out today, right? That's a thought. 
which then led to a feeling of reluctance in your body, which then doesn't want to make you jump in the car and go to the gym, especially on a rainy day, right? So it leads to a lack of action in that instance. Whereas if you change your energy and your thinking to, man, like, let's, what is the thought? Um, it might be, I feel really strong when I work out, right? That might be the thought, which then makes you feel excited about the transformation that your body is going through. Or it could be that you have a personal trainer waiting, right, at the gym, and you don't want to let that person down. You don't want to stand them up. So you're like, oh my gosh, someone is there waiting for me. I better go, which then creates a motivating thought in your body, which then, even though you might be reluctant, it creates the action of getting in the car and going because you don't want to stand that person up, right? So your energy impacts everything, everything. When we feel low and exhausted, that's our energy levels being low. I'm not just talking about physical energy. Your mental and emotional energy is going to be drained as well, right? Leading to your physical exhaustion, right? How often, like I'm someone who's experienced depression. And so my energy is very dense and low while I went through that. And when you are depressed, you don't feel like even getting out of bed. So your energy then affects how physically your body feels and moves, right? When we're in a great mood, when we are euphoric and blissful, our body physically feels lighter and we want to move more, right? So everything is interconnected. Your emotional, mental energy is connected to your physical energy and vice versa. Sometimes to shift our emotions and our mental state, we have to move our bodies. I often talk about get out in nature, like move your body, do somatic movement, so it's all interconnected, right? And we can use one to leverage the other. But today's episode is specifically about how to protect your energy and how to grow your energy. I'm going to share 10 different ways and examples, not examples, tips on how to protect your energy. And this topic came about because at one time in my Instagram stories, I talked about how I protect my energy before I go out somewhere, right? To an event that maybe I don't know a lot of people. I don't know what kind of energy I'm you know, I'm going to be faced with because everyone is always sending out energy. And this is something we pick up subconsciously, right? Like for instance, when you walk into a room, right? And there's like a, a, a friend that you know, who's super bubbly, who's super outgoing. And when you're in their company, you just walk away feeling really, really good, right? Why is that? You absorb some of their energy. You, you absorb some of their upbeat, positive thinking energy, and you walked away with that, right? And in the same way, if you walk into a room and someone's like a negative Nelly and you were in a perfectly good mood when you walked into that room, right? And then when you leave that room, you feel so drained. Like there's just that one friend who is always complaining, who nothing is ever good enough, right? We all have one of those probably. Like, and then you leave them and then you're like, oh my God, I was actually feeling pretty good when I walked in. Now I'm like drained and exhausted and I feel so down. Why is that? You absorbed some of their energy, right? But here's the thing. We don't have to be a victim to other people's energy. You can actually protect yourself so that you stop absorbing other people's stuff, right? Of course, we want to absorb the good stuff, but you never know what's going on underneath people's outside demeanor. So we always want to be very mindful of, is this my energy or is this your energy? Like, do I want to take on your energy? Do I not want to take on your energy? We can be very mindful and intentional of that. And in the past, I didn't even know. Like, I just would sometimes come back from parties feeling exhausted. And I didn't realize that subconsciously, um, like I'm someone who picks up very easily on energy and emotions. And a lot of times when you go out and come back, like we feel drained, not because we've been walking around the mall. Yes, that's part of it. But we've probably unknowingly picked up other people's crap and energy and their feelings and their drama and all of this stuff. And we don't want that, right? Like it's just like picking up other people's germs. Like we don't want, pick it, we don't want people's germs, right? We want to keep ourselves healthy. So that's what this episode is focused on. And I'm not... 100% like excellent at this. I'm still learning how to protect my energy and stuff, but I've become very aware 
and very like um, good at giving myself what I need in order to nourish myself, resource myself, protect myself. So here are my tips. So why, you know, why am I focused on energy in this episode? It's a way to safeguard your mental and emotional reserves, right? So you have more of yourself to give to the people you want to give to. Not knowing how to protect your energy and nourish it on a regular basis in a healthy way is what leads to burnout in people's lives. It's what leads to exhaustion. It's what leads to feeling like you're on the hamster wheel of life. So learning how to, I, I call it manipulating your energy, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a good way, right? We all need to know how to manipulate our energy so that it's always, we have more than enough, right? We don't want to be drained out of our life force energy. Like I said, that's what leads to burnout and disillusionment and loss of purpose and depression, etc. Um, so learning how to safeguard your energy means that you have plenty of mental and emotional reserves. So you have more of yourself to give to others, to the people that you want to give to. And it also stops things when we have plenty of energy and we know how to protect it and nourish it and grow it. We stop doing things like procrastination, avoidance, distractions, worry, stress, etc. Okay, so that's actually tip number one. If you want to protect your energy, it means that you stop the leaks that you have created in your life. It's, this is what I call energy leaks, okay? Energy leaks can look like procrastination. It can look like avoidance of things, like avoiding difficult conversations with people. It can be things like distraction, worry, and stress. These are all things that cause energy leaks. So for instance, my, one of my biggest energy leaks is I know that my credit card statement, the bill is coming up and I need to pay the credit card. And it's always in the back of my mind, but it's something that I actively avoid. So there's a part of me that feels guilt for avoiding it. There's a part, I'm sure the part of it has to do with shame that comes with not wanting to manage my finances in a grown up mature way. And then a part of it is also avoiding the discomfort that I'm going to feel when I see that credit card statement, right? So it's all of it. But the thing is, the avoidance and the distraction leads to shame and unworthiness, which are all energy leaks, right? Because it's not a feel-good feeling and it's constantly there and I'm avoiding do taking the action that I know is going to close up that energy leak, but I won't. So there are millions, I wouldn't say millions, there's probably tens, fifties, hundreds of things in your life that cause energy leaks. It's like that difficult conversation that you keep putting off with your spouse or multiple different conversations. It's um, look, avoiding, you know that you have certain things in your life that you just don't want to look at, but it's causing issues in your life and you've been avoiding it for many years. The thought of dealing with it overwhelms you and you just keep shelving it away. It might feel like you're locking it up and putting it away to deal with another day, but I promise you subconsciously and unconsciously, these are all leaks and it takes you away from living, right? Because it's, it's there somewhere in the back corner of your mind, just popping its head up once in a while, maybe several times a day, being like, oh, you haven't taken care of that. Oh, you haven't taken care of that. And it, and it causes this avalanche of other feelings, negative feelings, which are energy leaks. So... You've got to stop the things. When, when I mean stop, like do the hard work of taking care of the things that cause worry and stress. So we're going to go a little bit deeper in that. One of the ways you do that, number two, is setting boundaries, right? If there is a friend that is draining your mental and emotional energy, set a boundary and say, hey, I've offered you several solutions or I'm happy to help solve this problem. But like you, unfortunately, you don't, seem to want to solve the problem and just talking about it and complaining about it doesn't land well with me, right? These are really awkward, awful, uncomfortable conversations to have with a very close friend and you're going to come across like a heartless bitch, right? And we don't want to do that. 
We don't want to upset other people. That's not the type of person we are. But guess what? That's causing you. That's causing you an energy leak because you're not setting up boundaries. You're allowing that person to continue this drama in their life, right? You're actually being, you're being an enabler by not speaking up, which is, that is the role that you are playing, right? So you're both, that person is not the only one. I don't, I don't use, like to use the word blame because then that comes with shame attachment, right? But by not telling the friend, by not drawing these clear boundaries saying, uh-uh, I'm not available for that anymore. You are perpetuating the very habit that you want your friend to break. So you're part of the problem, right? If this person comes to you complaining about the same thing over and over and you've offered them solutions, right? You've done, you've done your job, but they're not, they just want to complain, right? They just like the drama, but they're not willing to admit that to themselves and they keep coming back to you with the same stuff. If you don't want to deal with that stuff anymore. You've got to say no. I still want to continue our relationship, but you cannot bring this problem to me anymore because you're not willing to solve it. And I don't want to feed into that. So let's just talk about something else, right? You can, you can do the kind thing. And now you've stopped enabling the issue, right? So start setting clear boundaries. Another boundary can look like this is really hard for people to establish, but like after 9 PM, I'm not going to check my phone, right? Because then we get on social media and then our bedtime gets messed up. Our brain gets messed up. Like I have a very clear boundary where I don't watch horror movies. I don't want any, I don't watch anything about like serial killers, rapists. Like the, there's this one drama on Netflix. that's the number one show. And it's based on a real life serial killer that existed. Like John Damer, or I forget it. I don't even know his name. Everyone on Facebook is talking about how awful this drama is and how sick it is, right? No judgment on anyone who's watched that show. But I have a mental, emotional boundary where I say, I will not watch anything that is that disturbing. And it unsettles me deeply. It takes me over a week to get over those type of shows. Like, why would I destroy my peace of mind? So it's knowing yourself really well to know what upsets you, right? And so I have a boundary that says, I will not allow these kind of TV shows and this drama that has anything to do with like physical harm, like physically hurting people, right? Um, I won't watch it, right? So I stick to like romance and drama and biopics and things like that, that stretch my emotional capacity to feel empathy and compassion and sadness, right? But not like sickness, like serial killers, things like that, where like um, war, right? Like I don't watch any movies based around war and things like that. That's just, that does not feel good to me in my heart space. And I don't want to numb myself to those things. So I just don't watch that. So we talked about number two, setting boundaries. Number three, the way you protect your energy is by starting to pay attention to your body and your emotions, right? Our bodies are communicating to us all the time about what feels good, and what does not, right? Like, so this weekend, or not this weekend, this past week, I went away to a friend's house for like 48 hours. It was just me and her. We hung out at her house and we did nothing but like watch TV, um, eat and drink and things like that. And I overconsumed alcohol, which I knew going in that it was okay. Like I was gonna let myself do that, right? But then at the end of the two days, like it took me a day to recover after I came back to stop feeling like crud. So this was something I decided intentionally. It just didn't happen by accident, right? And I was ready for the aftermath. But in the past, like I didn't know that alcohol drained my energy. Well, I did know, like we all talk about hangovers, right? But we don't, we don't take an intentional step and say, that doesn't feel good in my body anymore. Like I'm just not going to do that to myself, right? We let old habits take over where as soon as we're in a social setting and somebody offers us a glass of wine, we just go, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Like, it feels really good, right? But we don't pay effects to the aftermath of how long does it take me to recover? Like, what does it do to my mental and brain fog? What does it do to my physical body? So now, like, I do not take alcohol when I'm at home chilling out with my husband he can have a glass of wine I'm not going to judge him in any way but I don't like the way I feel after I've had a glass of wine or two glasses of wine 
So now I don't do it just because, right? Like I'm very mindful of this does not feel good. So I stop it. So you've got to pay attention to your body. So there are things that you are doing right now that on a slightly deeper level, you know, this isn't good for me. It doesn't make me feel good, right? And maybe again, going back to there's a relationship that you've had with a friend and you know, deep down in your heart that that friendship isn't right for you anymore. Or there's a certain sibling in your life that is always like jabbing jokes or being exceptionally harsh to you. And because they're your brother or sister, you just let it go because it's just family, right? So, but you know, exposing yourself to these things doesn't make you feel good and it drains your energy. So why do you keep letting it happen? And the excuse of, well, that's just the way it is. That just tells me that you're not prioritizing your own well-being and protecting your energy. And it's just easier to let things be, even though it's uncomfortable, it's you're telling yourself it's easier to just let things be than take action of correcting and rectifying these things in my life. So number four, understanding your triggers. One of the ways to protect your energy is to understand what are my triggers that cause my energy to implode, to drain, to leak, right? Um, for me, one of my triggers used to be, I'm trying to think, like to, to this day, one of my triggers is an uncluttered, like a cluttered space, right? When there's just stuff everywhere. And it's really hard with a young family with, you know, I live with three men, right? Boys, men, and they all, they don't care as much about taking care of the space as much as I do. Like I love the feeling of an organized clutter-free space, but my, the other three people that I love and I live with don't respect or value that as much. So one of the things that I have come to understand is my triggers is when I open all the dresser drawers, right, in any bedroom and look at crumpled up clothes, clean clothes that haven't been folded and put away, crumpled up clothes. So that's one of my triggers. And then it's, it's such a small thing, right? You walk into my master bedroom closet and my husband would have crumpled up a t-shirt. Like he thought he was going to wear that t-shirt. He would have pulled it out, changed his mind. And instead of refolding it, he would just stuff it back in crumpled up like that. And that's one of my triggers. I'd get so annoyed. Be like, oh, I spend so much time in this family, like folding and putting away stuff and nobody cares, right? So that's an energy leak. So what I've now decided is that rather than fighting with my family to put their things away properly, especially when it comes to laundry, it, for me, the benefit of doing the work of folding and putting things away in an organized way, the pleasure it brings me and the order and the clarity that I feel is much bigger than picking a fight with my family and battling it over and asking them to fix that, right? I just realized it's not as important to them and that's okay. I've accepted that. Not, I'm not going to fight that battle. So now, like when something's not right, and someone's crumpled a t-shirt, a clean t-shirt, and put it back in a perfectly otherwise folded dresser. I take a deep breath, I fold it properly, and I put it away, and I mention it to the person, hey, next time, would you mind putting it away properly, right? Yes, it's not a perfect solution. Perfect solution would be everybody followed my rules, right? But that's not the kind of world we live in, and we can't expect that. So you've got to learn to figure out what is my trigger here, what is a, what is a workaround that I can live with? That's going to give me the benefits of what I desire. Right? So now I fold the clothes the way I want to. And I've started asking my older one to put away his clothes and I gently guide him on how to put it away properly. And I actually had this conversation with him. I said, look, putting clothes away in a neat way is something that's very important to me. That is a priority and a value to me. And I understand it. it's not that for you. And I can't force you or pressure you to make one, to make it that way for you. That's not fair on you. But one of the ways, one of the love languages for me is when my family goes out of their way to keep things neat in their dresser and drawer, because I spend a lot of time lovingly folding these clothes and organizing them for you. So if you feel like you want to express your love to me in this way. It's one of the ways you can help me, right? So he knows. And so now I actually do see him make an effort. I fold his clothes and he puts it away 
the way that I have shown him to, right? And I don't, and I've decided I'm not going to explode at my kids if they don't put away their clothes properly. I gently ask them over and over to do it. So that is me understanding my triggers and setting up a system or a process that works for all of us, right? So there's always a give and take. It can't be like, you've got to follow my rules, right? That is also not fair. So this takes an immense amount of awareness and healing work, right? Like I had to heal this wound of like, nobody respects me. That is the, that's probably what we're all thinking, right? Like I feel disrespected. No, like the things I want, nobody cares about. Those are all deep emotional trigger wounds. And it's not the actual truth. The actual truth is my family love and respect me very much. But because that wound exists, I look at everything that's happening external to me and use it as evidence to support the wound. That will not work well for family dynamics or any relationship, right? Because then you're just going to walk around feeling like a victim all day long and telling the story of nobody respects me, nobody cares what I want, people don't truly get me, things like that. That you've got to re realize that is a trigger wound and I need to work on the wound and therefore the, the trigger itself won't feel so painful. And then I can come up with an actual solution that works for both parties at the end of the day. Okay. So number five, understand what drains you and ask yourself, can I delegate it or outsource it? Now I realize not everybody has a resource to delegate things or outsource things, but a lot of times we do. And we tell ourselves a story of, I can't afford it. Right. I used this example on my stories the other day on every Sunday or Saturday night, I sit down, I plan my meals for the week and I order groceries online, right? And I pay $10 for the delivery charge. Okay. Now for some people it'll be like, man, that's a waste of money. Like, why don't you just go to the grocery store and do it yourself? And I would have, I would have fully thought this kind of thought a few years ago, right? like 10 or $20 or $15. Um, and you also run the risk of the person who picks out your fresh produce. They might not do a good job as you do, right? Like I needed a certain kind of plantain, like a mid right plantain. And they might've brought me a green raw plantain or a yellow plantain that wouldn't have like, so you don't get, so you have to lose some control over the fact that you're placing online grocery order, right? And you're paying an extra $10. So. How do we get on the subject? Oh, delegating. But my grocery store that I like to shop at is 20 minutes away from where I live, right? So that's a total of 40 minutes. Now I'm adding to my day or taking away from my time. And then there's also the time that it takes me to go around the grocery aisle and pick up the things I want. So to today in my life, my time is more important than the $10 that I'm saving. And for most of you listening, you're all busy moms, you're all working moms, you have kids, you have so many responsibilities, but you're probably also someone who has not completely or haven't even thought about working through your money wounds and the, and the money shame and the money unworthiness, right? Which is really what the fear of money comes from and this need to save money wherever possible, right? So what happens now is that in order to save those, this example, that $10, dollars i I'm, I'm spending two hours to two and a half hours of my day to go get groceries and groceries is not shopping for groceries is not something that I enjoy anyway. So now I'm draining my energy. I am giving away my time. That's because I haven't figured out what is valuable to me, right? It's because we don't have a clear understanding of our priorities. I would much rather spend that two and a half hours cleaning out maybe a clutter in my house, doing yoga, right? Focusing on my mental and physical well-being rather than trying to save the $10. So figure out what drains you in your life. Maybe that's grocery shopping. Maybe that's meal planning. Maybe that's doing laundry. Maybe that's doing dishes, right? But we tell ourselves and force ourselves and say, this is what a mom has to do. This is what my mom did. This is what I was taught to do. 
So if I don't do all these things and I'm failing as a mom, right? And we don't give ourselves the freedom to pay somebody to come help us with those things. Like for a while, I used to pay somebody to come twice a week to come fold all my laundry, guys, because that used to take me a few hours. And both me and my husband hated it. I also hated seeing the clean pile of laundry on my bed every day. That used to drain my energy. But folding laundry also used to drain my energy. So what's the other option? I can be like, oh, God, like, ugh, like let it drain my energy. Or you can be like, okay, I don't want to do my laundry. I also don't like seeing the pile of laundry on my bed. How can we, how can we do this in a way that is nourishing to all of us? Well, for me, it feels really good to pay somebody to come do the job. So find things in your life that drain you, find somebody to do it. Like bookkeeping, right? In my business, I used to hate doing the numbers. It used to cause me so much stress and worry and shame. And now I just pay somebody at the end of the month to do it. For example, this podcast, right? It takes a lot of behind the scenes work to get these podcast episodes out. It takes editing. It takes typing out show notes. You got to check the links are right. You got to know how to work the technology of the distributor platform, how to get it to upload. You got to clean up and edit everything. Like it takes a lot of work. And if it was up to me to save money in my business, I could do all of it myself, right? Save myself a heck of a lot of money. But then guess what? Making my podcast would no longer be fun. I would dread all the behind the scenes stuff and I would procrastinate and I would start missing weeks. Like, oh, I'll just skip it this week. I don't have time to edit it. Oh, I can't do it properly, right? I don't have the time to do all the to-do lists under my podcast that requires of a release. So I'm just going to skip it. And so the inconsistency starts to happen and, and the listenership drops off because I'm not being consistent and my energy isn't as excited while I'm recording the episodes, right? So I actually hire someone and I pay someone extremely talented to do all the stuff that I don't want to do behind the podcast. The only thing that I love about my podcast is showing up and recording it. That's it. I stick my camera on, I stick my microphone in, I turn on my laptop and I hit the record button. That's all I do for my podcast, right? And that's why my energy is so clean. And you guys are attracted to listening to it every week because my energy is clean. If I came with the Oh God, I'm going to have to edit this stuff. It takes so long. I hate to edit it. I don't want to do the graphics. Oh, I got to type out the email. My energy completely changes to when I show up to record my podcast. It, it won't come with this enthusiasm and passion and excitement, right? Because I pay somebody and delegate it and they operate in their zone of genius, right? The person that helps me behind the scenes. They thrive and they excel and their brain works in a way my brain does not. So I am so happy to give them the money so they can go attach their good energy to this podcast, right? Because then when you guys listen to it, you feel the love, you feel the passion because I just stick to what I'm great at and the person I hired is sticking to what they're good at and our good energy then works together and it spreads the good energy through the world. This is how energy works, you guys, okay? So figure out in your life what you can delegate and outsource so you can conserve your own energy for doing the things that come easily to you with passion and fire. Um, make sure you, number six, make sure your environment, your physical space is clutter-free or whatever makes you happy, right? If you love the color yellow and that makes you feel happy, like make sure you have the yellow color in your rooms, right? Like I have a yellow chair that I always sit on and it brings me so much joy, right? Make sure the clothes you wear are full of the colors you love. Like the physical space that you have as much as possible, make sure it's like clutter free. Like your physical space makes such a big difference to your energy. I don't think that's rocket science for anyone. Okay, um, number eight, I think we're number, seven, no, seven. Become aware of your thoughts and how they drain you, right? So things like overthinking, self-criticism, self-judgment, anger, hatred, holding grudges, all of these are energy leaks, right? These are all negative feelings and negative thoughts. And when you are down on yourself, when you are the first one to talk 
negatively about yourself, when you say things like, I'm terrible, I suck, why can't I just get it right? Why can't I figure things out? I'm so lazy, I'm not good enough, I'll never get there. These are all such heavy thoughts and emotions that are stuck in your body and they will continue to drain your energy in every which way possible. So this is, these are massive energy leaks, right? The self-hatred and the self-resentment, the self-judgment, self-criticism, massive energy leaks. That's your biggest gusher right there. So this is why your inner healing is so, so, so important. When you start to learn to like, love, and accept yourself, these energy leaks will start to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And when you love yourself, that's how you nourish yourself. Okay? So you know where to find me if you want to do the work of inner healing and closing these gushers, these artery gushers of self-criticism, self-hatred, self-judgment, unworthiness, undeservingness. Right? These are all huge energy leaks in your life. Um, number eight, do things you love. So this is one of the things that builds your energy, right? How many times during a day, during the week, do you give yourself permission to do simply things that you love without playing the I don't have time card, everybody needs me, I can't put myself first, like how many times a day do you play that card? Part of it is you love being that martyr. I'm sorry to tell you, right? A lot of us love playing this, oh my gosh, like I can't get away. My family needs me. They can't survive without me for two days card, right? We love feeling important and needed. So even though we are exhausted and close to burning out, we tell ourselves, well, I can't, my family comes first. I have to sacrifice myself so that my family can survive and thrive, right? What you are doing is saying, I have to become less and less and less of myself so that I can give more to others. And that is such a lie because you actually will be able to give even more of yourself if you take the time to nourish and replenish yourself and your energy, right? It's actually your ego saying you're so important, you're so needed, like you need to destroy yourself. Like that argument makes no sense. I am so important to this family, but I cannot get away to make myself feel good, right? It comes from a place of feeling deeply, deeply unworthy that the minute you disappear, go take care of yourself, people are gonna find out that, oh, we can actually manage without her. And then what, is, what does that mean about you, right? So our sense of being and our self-worth is so low, like we don't want to take the risk of disappearing for a few days for the fear that we'll find out we're not needed after all, right? That's why we do that to ourselves. So it comes from a, a place of deep fear and ego. So what are you doing to take care of yourself? On a regular basis, we're not talking about that one girl's weekend that I take every year, right? Taking care of yourself is actually a really hard thing to do on a daily basis. But if you are going to be operating at your optimal energy, it's like cleaning house, right? If you clean your house once a year, it's going to take so much time and drain your energy. And you're not going to get that much done in one weekend of the year to clean your house, right? Cleaning your house regularly means doing the dishes and making sure the sink is clean every day, washing your toilets every few days, changing your sheets, like it's a regular thing. And so in the same way, what are you doing on a regular basis to nourish yourself? Now me, I need a lot of time alone to nourish myself on a regular basis. So that means I do breath work every day, right? I do like a 30 minutes of subliminal sounds. Sometimes I need a nap on the weekend. Excuse me, I'm burping as I say this. I try to do yoga like three to four times a week, right? I just went away for two days with a girlfriend and I left my family, right? I need a lot in terms of me time to feel really good and feel centered and grounded and to be there 
in a safe way for my kids so that I'm not lashing out and being the angry mother when they are lashing out and have had a bad day. I have realized that I have an incredible amount of patience for my own kids when I have taken a really good job of taking care of myself that day. And essentially, isn't that what we want? We want to be a safe, centered, grounded place for our families and our kids and our parents and our siblings. We want to feel so good in who we are. We want to feel so rooted, so stable in ourselves that whoever comes to us with their storminess, they can take shelter under us, right? What if your roots are not that strong because you, you have not taken the time to feed yourself, to nourish yourself, to ground yourself, right? That's how a tree grows its roots. It takes the nutrients it needs from the environment. And the tree grows so big and tall and strong and wide and deep into the ground that when there is rain, you come under that tree and you feel so good and you lean against that tree because it feels so steady. When you do things to take care of yourself every day, and what I mean by every day is tune into my feeling, breathe, center myself, find, find myself within, self-reflect, clean up my relationships, have difficult conversations, right? When we do those kind of things every day, then your roots become so deep and grounded and solid so that people realize, oh, she's such a safe space right? That's why it's so important to take care of your energy. Okay. Number nine, build authentic relationships, right? What I mean by that, why are the relationships in your life that you're doing so that you can impress people or you're pleasing somebody? And I realized that when we don't have authentic and real relationships, that's a real energy leak because you are pretending to be someone you're truly not. You're hiding your true feelings. You're, tr you're hiding your true self. And you're saying, this part of me won't be accepted, so I'm not going to laugh as loud. I'm not going to do my snorty laugh. I'm not going to dress the way I normally dress, right? These are all examples. But when we don't have real authentic relationships with people, we are projecting a version of ourselves that we think will be accepted, and that drains your energy. Because you're not being true, and when we're not being true, that takes more energy out of us right? Because you're trying to play chess and trying to guess what this person wants and needs from you and what you think you need to do to please them. That takes so much mental chess work and that drains your energy. What could be easier than just being your true self, right? When we are being our most honest, true selves, it doesn't take any work. It's effortless. And that's what conserves and builds your energy. So finally, I have one more thing I wanted to say that I was, that I was waiting till the end. Okay. And the final tip that I want to give you to protect your energy is literally when you go out to somewhere, like a mall or a social gathering, you can protect your energy, right? So that you are not leaking your energy and people are not taking your energy away from you without your permission. Um, and the way I do that is I do a visualization. And this is the last tip I'm going to leave you with is I pretend that there is a central column of light that comes from above my head. So it's like the universe above my crown chakra, and it's sending this huge beam of white light, right? Going through the crown of my head. And I, and I imagine that white light, I feel the texture of it. I feel the temperature of it. So for some people, it can feel cool. For some people, it can feel warm. Some people, it can feel like a mist, right? And there's no right or wrong way to do this. This is how I do it. And I pretend this column of light coming through me, through my spine and down my legs and it grounds and that column of light goes down to the center of the earth. So now I'm feeling this light going all the way from up above my head, down to my toes and all the way into the center of the earth. So I'm super grounded and centered, right? And then I imagine this column expanding out, expanding out, and then it becomes a bubble around me. So I visualize this white, it can be golden light for you if you like it, it can be yellow light, whatever color feels really good to you. And I expand this, I pretend or visualize 
that this bubble is all around me. It's my bubble. It's my safe space. And you can imagine inside of this bubble, it's a beautiful space. So maybe it's a beach, right? Wherever you are, imagine some, a space that you can draw energy from and feel really good. Now, for me, that's a beach, a warm beach where I can hear the ocean waves. I can feel the warm sunlight. I see the tropical paradise island, right? Like mountains filled with lush trees. I feel the breeze on my skin. I see the turquoise water. Like as soon as I'm in that space, I start to feel so relaxed, so calm, so good. And then I imagine this white bubble around me. This is my energetic bubble. And you can make this energetic bubble as small or as big as you want, right? I imagine this bubble to be about three feet on either side. So it's, it's a total of six feet diameter or as wide as my arms. If you're watching this on video, my arms are stretched out. Um, and that's the diameter of the circle, right? And it goes like three feet above me and three feet underneath me. And that is my energetic bubble. And when I go to places and events and I'm surrounded by people that I don't necessarily know, or I know anything about the energy, I just imagine that their energy bounces off of my energetic bubble. So nobody gets to step into my bubble. They might physically get close to me, but the energy is outside of that diameter of that bubble, right? So nobody gets to come inside that bubble and I don't step outside of that bubble. And it, this is just a visualization energy, you guys. Play with it. Practice it. Do it one day when you go out. See how you feel when you come back and do it another day without doing it. See how you feel. I promise you this stuff works. I know it can sound crazy to have an energetic bubble. But anytime I go to the mall, like the mall, I just feel drained when I go to the mall a lot of times. So I, I limit the time I go to a mall. And it's also very different after COVID, right? We all spent two years locked up in our houses. So when you, you know, if he was someone who loved going out before and drew energy from it, and after COVID, you go out and you don't have the same level of energy, it's because your energetic capacity has changed for people and energy, right? So it's like a muscle. You might have to expand it. Or you might just find that you like this new version where she doesn't enjoy going out as much. But going back to the mall example, I, when I remember to draw this energetic bubble, I feel much, much better when I come back. A lot of times when I forget to do it, which I do, I come back with headaches. I get quite a few headaches. Um, and that's because my energy is drained and I didn't protect it, right? And that never used to be the case, but it's just as I clean up my own energy, I become much more sensitive to energies. And so I pick up on energies. And so I just have to learn. It's a lesson I learned. It's a mistake I made. Oh my gosh, I feel so drained and I have a headache and I feel icky. I forgot to like protect my energy today. Okay, lesson learned. Let me try again next time. This is not to shame ourselves. This is just to learn lessons. All right. So I hope you enjoyed the 10 tips that I just shared with you on how to protect your energy. I would love to hear from you on what you thought about this episode. If you already do it and you have other tips, like I would love to hear from you. All right, you guys, I love you so much. Take care. Bye.